Hi everyone and welcome to our talk on Contemporary Digital Linguistics and the Archive, an urgent review. I'm here with Sarah Babinski to talk about uh, some recent work we've been doing on evaluating archives for potential issues in using them in the future for linguistic projects. So let's start by thinking about the, the problem that, uh, that we're aimed at looking at. Digital language corpora are very heterogene heterogeneous, and of course they should be heterogeneous. They are recorded under many different circumstances uh, with many different types of material. But for digital work, most of our standards were formalized 15 years or more ago before much recent digital work was possible. So for instance, we can look at the Burden Simons 2003 or Linda Barwick's 2006 paper uh, to see about the types of uh, standards that digital collections are being uh, created with standards for. But in the last 15 years, many new types of digital materials can be created. We can manipulate digital files in many different ways. And it's possible that our, uh, our archival standards haven't really caught up with that. So for instance, we can do things with our corpora that were just either totally impossible 15 years ago or required huge amounts of, uh, of additional equipment. Like for instance, doing phonetic analyses on laptops or running text to speech and speech to text programs. So, so that's part of our problem. The other part of this problem is that much of our linguistic training focuses on producing materials for archives, not working on materials from archives. And this is a bit of a generalization, but on the whole, our training looks something like this, where we have a gigantic amount of um, workflow and discussion around preparing materials, preparing elicitation sessions and field sessions, post-processing that data and so on. And then the end point is to send to archive, which I've circled here in purple. Um, so we, we think about the language documentation process as the, um, as the where the archives are the end point of this, uh, of this process, not as the beginning point. So what, what does this look like when take from archive or use with archive is the starting point for a, uh, set, of, a set of materials? And so that's the, the question that Sarah and I are asking. Are our collections as useful as they could be when they become the primary mode of linguistic research? So should we do things better than we're currently doing them? Are we making more work for ourselves with our current practices? And are we causing problems for our future selves? So future linguists who are going to be primarily relying on archival materials for endangered languages, for instance, are they going to be able to do the things they want to do because of the decisions we've we've made. So today we're going to talk about those sorts of questions. So what types of variation are there in digital corpora? How does this variation affect what's possible in terms of analyses? And how does the structure of the corpus facilitate or impede work with the collection by people who didn't collect those materials in the first place? To address these questions, we're currently looking at a sample of 23 different collections from Paradisec, ELA and IATSIS, so three prominent digital archives. All of these collections were collected using the best practices of the time. There's a combination of digitized corpora and natively digital corpora, so corpora that were recorded digitally from the start. Our materials date from the 1970s to about 2010. Um, and all of these deposits have audio files and uh, almost all of them have ELAN transcription files as, uh, as well. And we're combining this with the collected experience working with text files and corpus materials from the Turella Documentation Project for Australian Languages. Uh, and just before we go on, I just want to make, a, uh, make it clear that this is not some sort of gotcha type um, audit where we are trying to name and shame uh, corpora for um, being hard to use or anything like that. Uh, while our illustrations, or sorry, while our examples are real, our illustrations for this talk were created for the, uh, for the purpose. And so we're not going to name any particular collections. Um, rather, what we want to do is focus on collective standards and better practices practices, not on criticizing individuals, because as field workers ourselves, we realize that materials are collected under many different circumstances and uh, as part of making archives and so on, huge numbers of choices need to be, uh, need to be made. 
I should also stress that we're not working by the numbers, as it were. So this is not a review of corpora and collections based on the size of the corpora or the amount of materials. Rather, it's based on the function to which the materials in the corpus can be put. Okay, so um, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to talk about the types of issues that we've um, found in the collections that we've looked at. Great, thanks. Um, so when we were looking at these corpora, um, we came across a handful of sort of categories of issues, um, which I'll sort of summarize here and then go into more detail with some examples um, after that. Um, so first we have um, missing information, things that should be there but aren't. Um, and these can be um, either recoverable or non-recoverable. So if missing information is recoverable, um, you know, you can sort of reconstruct um, the thought process of the archiver or manually fix something um, to make things work the way that you need them to and have the information that you need. Um, but sort of the more um, crucial and serious um, issue is when information is not recoverable um, in its archived state. Um, so if there are completely missing files, missing transcriptions or translations, um, things that the person using your um, collection can't actually figure out um, by looking at it themselves. And then uh, we also have information that's not missing, um, but that causes other sorts of issues. Um, so we have uh, information that just shouldn't be there. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's just kind of a mistake and it needs to be deleted. And this is usually just annoying and doesn't uh, necessarily cause huge issues in our um, the processing on the part of the person using your materials. Um, and then there are also errors. Um, of course, we all try to avoid having errors um, in our content or in um, where things are placed. For example, if you had um, a translation on a tier where a transcription was meant to be. Um, but of course, you know, that's also uh, something that we should be thinking about. Um, and content errors uh, in particular, uh, again, can't be recovered by the person who's using um, your materials. Um, so that could sort of end up compounding um, in certain situations uh, when someone else is using um, your data. Um, and then there's also information that is um, fine. It should be there. Um, but for formatting reasons or other sorts of issues, it causes um, a lot of just time consuming uh, inconvenience on the part of the person who's using your materials. Okay, um, so let's start with some things that shouldn't be there. Um, so these are things that uh, are not missing. Um, they are, uh, should, be, um, should be fixed. Um, and should be deleted in some cases. Um, so for example, we have um, a situation where there are multiple copies of the same file, um, different versions of the same file. Um, so for an example here, um, we have an original file from uh, 2005, it seems, um, based on the uh, dates we have um, that has a particular name. Um, and then the archiver has uh, revised this and created a revised version. These are the uh, top files uh, with rev at the end. Um, and these are obviously much more um, recent uh, uh, passes through the data. Um, they had been modified actually the day of the screenshot. Um, so of course that's the transcription and the translation that we'll want to use. Um, but the issue is that the file name is now different than the name of the audio uh, wave file. So when you open uh, your ELAM file, it won't be able to find this wave file. And you may actually think um, when you're first looking at this that the files that have the same name are the ones that go together, um, when in fact it would be better to use the revised versions. And then we have um, errors. Um, so some of these include uh, font and encoding issues. Um, such as uh, stray non-printing characters, non-breaking spaces, um, single Chinese characters that usually show up um, because of some kind of font problem um, or a conversion issue. Um, and then there are also encoding conversion errors. 
Um, so for example, legacy Mac files um, may be incorrectly saved as Unicode. Um, so if we have um, a nice, perfectly good looking word, um, like Nachi, um, it could end up being converted into something completely unreadable and not recoverable um, by the person looking at your data. And we also have an issue with delimiters being in the wrong places. So for example, um, tabs within your records could cause problems in terms of um, reading in files by any sort of automatic computational type program, um, which can cause a lot of havoc um, on the part of people using your collection. And there are also errors um, of different types. So uh, file name mismatches, um, we sort of covered that um, already. Different types of line breaks. Um, so Mac and Windows have different ways of uh, printing line breaks to begin with. So that's not a huge issue and it's something that uh, anyone using your information should be aware of, but it becomes an issue when the types of line breaks uh, are inconsistent. Um, so inconsistency is really a big problem, especially when you're using um, automatic methods. Um, they can be really hard and really annoying to fix. And there are also uh, underlines that you uh, create in a Word document, for example, um, that then gets lost when imported into other programs. So um, sort of formatting issues that um, don't translate um, across different file formats and that uh, is then information lost. And now I will uh, give it back to Claire um, to talk about some more of the issues that we've come across. All right, so Sarah um, talked about the uh, types of material that uh, material that is there and uh, either raises errors or uh, causes more work for processing. Uh, another large collection of uh, issues for working with corpora are the things that should be there but aren't. That is the missing material that um, wasn't archived along with the collection but is nonetheless important for being able to uh, work with the collection materials. And um, I'll start by just giving one example of uh, things like this. So, um, so take a file like this. This is an Elan transcript file where we have the uh, file, uh, the, the speech segmented into, uh, into utterances, but the transcripts are em empty. Here. So we have nothing in the transcript file, nothing in the translation file. And so presented with a file like this, it's not clear to someone who's using the collection for the first time whether this is an import error, whether it was something where the files were created but uh, the researcher didn't have time to transcribe them, which is a, of course a very common problem. Um, but faced with this sort of thing, we don't know if this is an import error and the material is available elsewhere or whether it's uh, genuinely missing data that was uh, that was not collected. Um, we have quite a few different types of crucially missing files in uh, in archives. So we have things like Elan preference files, where the for the most part the preferences contain information that is recoverable, but they also contain information where there are multiple audio files. What the offset should be, um, and so if those files are not recorded, then the transcripts the the aligned uh, the alignments on the tiers do not align properly with the files that should be uh, that, that are connected to it through the audio. Um, the empty annotations I talked about. We have things again with say toolbox settings files or um, material that is partially recoverable given that toolbox often uses a set of standard format markers, but we also have cases where the researchers uh, make up their own uh, backslash codes. And then if those are not recorded, then we don't, we don't know or we have to guess about what sort of information is, uh, is there. Or if there are multiple versions of files, we need to guess which uh, crucial versions of the texts or the lexicon link to, uh, to each other for the parser. Uh, we also have the converse problem where if the toolbox settings files were not uh, were, were not archived as part of the archive, sometimes we only have the toolbox settings files. So we have the project file or we have the font files, but the data files were stored in a separate location on the computer and were not included in the archive. And of course, that's absolutely crucially missing for the uh, for working with the language. 
Uh, more generally, we find examples of missing metadata um, or metadata that's partially complete or uh, insufficiently linkable to the um, to the collection. So we we know that there are several speakers, maybe speaking several different languages, but we don't know which files go with which speaker, for example. Um, and um, uh, there are also things that are maybe not quite missing information, but uh, cause issues for mapping between the information, the types of information that are there, because we have things like tier names and speakers, but we're not quite sure which goes with which. And there are many different ways to do this with, uh, with ELAN. So, okay, so that's a brief summary of the most common types of issues we found in looking at the corpora that we've examined. Now I'd like to go on to talking about some of the recommendations. Um, and these are very much work in progress and things that we would like to discuss as a, as a field and as a set of documenters um, in uh, collaboration with, uh, with all the people we work with and archives and so on as well. So uh, first of all, for recommendations, um, while working on the collection itself and while working on the materials for archiving, consistency is really important. So be as consistent as possible and document the decisions that you make about the choices for how, uh, how you uh, set up files, okay? And that will be useful both for your future self, um, but also for future archive users as well, who won't have, a, won't have access to the uh, decisions that, uh, that you made and why you made them. While archiving, uh, while, while preparing the collection for archiving, uh, you should ask, uh, does this file need to be there? So uh, that will both cut down on material that is archived that probably shouldn't have been archived, like the multiple version control issues, but also on missing data or missing settings files and, uh, and things like that. So you might want to do some tests on your archived materials and imagine that you're working with that collection rather than your day-to-day -day collection materials. Can you find everything you need? Is everything linked in the way that you expect it to be linked? Um, and you might want to think about what other users of the collection might need uh, in the future. So say, for example, you are not doing speech to text work, but you could imagine your corpus being used for speech to text work in the future. Are the relevant files there, um, for example? Uh, and for the future, we'd like to see some uh, improved infrastructure for corpus processing and things like validation checks, which field workers could do before uploading their collections. And I know some archives have uh, things along these lines um, for, say, validating directory structure and file format and, uh, and things like that. But we feel that these could be built into the kind of pre-archiving process and could be, uh, at least to some extent, archive neutral as, uh, as well. Um, I think so. Uh, these in this slide, uh, which you're welcome to pause the video and look at, we have some more information about types of solutions, types of things that we talked about earlier about while working with the um, uh, with the collection. So thinking about standardizing sampling rates and file types, uh, noting which uh, types of information are missing for yourself, and adding that sort of material. Um, being consistent with file formats where possible, um, and also keeping an eye on things which um, are less consistent and may not make much of a difference for humans interacting with the collection, like notes in tiers and things like that, but being aware that they make a big difference for computational processing and they can make the difference between a corpus that's very easy to use and easy to, say, turn into a talking dictionary or something like that, and a corpus that's quite difficult to use um, for that sort of computational processing. Okay. Um, I want to say something very brief about validation checks as well. So we, uh, there are, of course, a number of validation checks that could be done, but we were thinking things along the lines of work that could be done for field workers while they are uh, still processing their collection. So thinking about, for instance, what is in transcripts? What is the com most common uh, character in a transcript? If there are large numbers of single words that have X or XXX or something like that, then that would be an indication that that file hasn't been properly transcribed or that file uh, needs, needs more information. Um, we could imagine a validation check where we have a list of files and uh, if the collection identifies toolbox settings files, um, or toolbox data files, are there also settings files? So are there text files with backslash codes? And if so, are there also .prj files and things like that? 
if there are .eaf files, are there also .pfs files, things like, uh, things like that. And if those files are missing, the collector could be asked if they need to be included. Uh, and that would raise the uh, raise consciousness around what's, uh, what's missing while not forcing the collector to use a particular set of, uh, of formats. Um, and now I'm going to hand back to Sarah for conclusions. So um, really the main takeaways here are, you know, these archives and archival materials are extremely important, um, both for communities and for linguists um, going into the future. Um, and we want to continue to be able to use them. Um, but as we've sort of talked about here, um, they aren't necessarily as useful as they could be. Um, there are things that we can do better, um, but a lot of these things are fixable. Um, so going back to our original questions, um, what types of variation are there in digital corpora? Um, a lot. Um, so some of this is inevitable, um, but some of it could really be streamlined um, and made more consistent. Um, how does this variation affect what's possible? Um, so this in can increase manual processing time um, if things are inconsistent or if there are a lot of errors. Um, and it can even make some types of work impossible. Um, so we, of course, want to try to avoid that as much as we can. And how does the structure of the corpus facilitate or impede work with the collection? Um, so with missing information um, and data, um, we really come across a lot of issues um, and, uh, you know, it can really impede uh, the work that people want to do um, with archival materials, um, especially um, as we are now in this more digital age. Okay, thank you uh, again for coming to this talk and we look forward to hearing your questions and comments.